This program is a Warren Stiebel production in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line is made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated, and the Friends of Firing Line. Uh, the confusion these days on the matter of sexual harassment was highlighted uh, by the finding in the Paula Jones case. There, the judge said that there had been no verifiable suffering from Ms. Jones on account of her alleged harassment by Governor Clinton. Moreover, there had been no quid pro quo, that is to say, no formal or intimidating return would come to her by reason of her willingness or her unwillingness to receive these suitors' advances. Uh, that finding uh, split the feminist lobby, much of which holds that threats need not be made. They are implicit in certain situations in which the aggressor or the suitor, if you prefer, is dominantly situated. To discuss this question, we have uh, Nadine Strosen, who is president of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, Ms. Strosen is professor of law at the New York Law School. She graduated from Harvard, Radcliffe, and then from the Harvard Law School where she was an editor of the Law Review. Her best known writing is Defending Pornography, Free Speech, Sex, and the Fight for Women's uh, Rights. Lino Gralia is an outspoken uh, critic of judicial activism and uh, uh, is a professor of law at the University of Texas Law School. He's native of Brooklyn, who attended City College and then Columbia University Law School, where he was editor of the Law Review. He is the author of Disaster by Decree, the Supreme Court's decisions on race in the schools. And then Leon Botstein, our host here at Bard College, is the president of Bard College. He's professor in the arts and humanities at Bard and is also the music director of the American Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Botstein is a graduate of the University of Chicago with advanced degrees from Harvard. Let me begin by asking Professor Strosen to bring us up to date on the recent controversy as as it went forward before the Supreme Court recently. The problem is that to this date, Bill, the Supreme Court has recognized the concept of what's called hostile environment workplace harassment, but has given almost no guidance whatsoever as to what facts, what evidence is necessary in order to make out a case. Now, let me clear away one basic distinction. When there are two basic kinds of illegal sexual harassment, one I think is not really subject to much debate, but let's put it on the table. It's called quid pro quo mm -hmm. sexual harassment. If somebody clearly threatens an employee. I'll fire you if you don't. Exactly. Sure. Um, that is actionable and the employer is automatically responsible. The difficult one is hostile environment sexual harassment, which the Supreme Court has simply said uh, will be determined, I'm going to read the exact language, whenever the evidence shows that the action is sufficiently severe or pervasive to alter the conditions of the victim's employment. How do you answer that question? All the Supreme Court has said is you have to look at all the facts and circumstances. Uh, the second case that the court had on this issue, uh, they overturned a lower court that had said that without evidence of actual tangible psychological injury, no case could be made out. The Supreme Court rejected that. It said actual tangible injury is one piece of evidence, yeah, one gotcha. factor that can be taken into account, but it's not absolutely required. Uh, Mr. Bassan, how, how do you weigh in on this uh, question? Well, the, the difficulty is when you step away from the legal issue, it has to do with the human realities of the way we interact with one another in the workplace where sexuality has always been part of it from the very beginning. It's a fact, whatever one's sexual preference is, that the reality is between employers and employees, between colleagues, between professors and students, sexuality is a factor. And it's a factor of human life. It's also a factor of, of individual judgment. And the, the, the difficult question, of course, is applying general rules to specific issues where emotions and individual circumstances are very important. And the guiding, the dividing line between public and private behavior. 
Uh, the well, workplace about, is a public about, place, yeah. and at the same time, they're private relations between individuals. And there's a, a tremendously awkward and difficult <sighs> fact as we try to regulate the variety, the unbelievable, unimaginable variety of human behavior. Well, what about the question of, of inherent hierarchy? If you've got, say, a colonel who says to his corporal secretary, uh, I'd like to have a date with you tonight says nothing beyond that, is the mere fact of his saying it, given the fact that he's a colonel and she's a corporal, does that invite certain conclusions? Well, let's take a senior faculty member and a junior faculty member. Sure, same thing. Uh, let's say a faculty member and a student. It's really about power, and the real question is, however, what about, let's walk away from real life and go to novels. We've spent a lot of time watching television, reading books about men fascinated with powerful women. You know, Patyomkin and Catherine the Great. Um, what about Elizabeth I and Sir Walter Raleigh in Essex? Now, uh, imagine the Elizabethan period. Now, we have made these people into, into mythic figures, but the fact remains is that why people are sexually attracted to one another for whatever reason is so complicated and so diverse that, in fact, it may be uh, the power relations, the age difference, all kinds of things. Would to, what extent, it, yeah. to what extent are we, as employers, I think Nadine's absolutely right. There's a clear harassment issue. It gets very awkward in, in, in cases where, um, where we are using sexuality, really, as the battleground to define um, the distinction between private and public expectations. But to what extent can personal prejudices or likes influence the way one behaves? Well, let me ask Mr. Gralia, uh, on the Paula Jones case, about which we all know a fair amount, uh, do you think that uh, the judge ruled uh, persuasively? Let me uh, make the issue a little bit more precise. As I understand it, if a employer says to a female employee, for example, have sex with me and you'll do well in this company. That's a good program. Or, That's or, a good program. Yeah. Or if you don't, uh, you won't do well. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has sex with him and does well. That's quid pro quo. No question she has a case. He got the sex, she got the promotion, there's a case. Supposing she says, uh, he says the same thing and she says no, and she doesn't get the promotion. Again, she clearly has a case. Mm -hmm. he, she, he, he said she was he punished been, for not doing this. Threat, yeah. Now, the interesting case, and supposedly, or the difficult one, and really what is said to be the Paula Jones case is, supposing the employer or superior, as in that case, uh, says, uh, have sex with me, and she stalwartly says no, and there doesn't appear to be any penalty. She is not punished. Well, that's the issue of the invasion. I think, uh, I don't want to quote him incorrectly, but Kenneth Galbraith once said when they passed the very good sexual harassment statutes at Harvard, you know, that uh, he would have been unable to marry his wife. That is to say, the history of relationships which are based and go on for a long time because of power relationships that are unequal. Spooning. Yeah, creates an enormous, an enormous bias, which we then enforce through law, that equality, I happen to believe in this, but it's a very interesting issue. Equality of station is a precondition for private interaction. And the precise issue that is before the Supreme Court in the last case that was argued before it is yeah, the one that, that. that, that Lino yeah. has, has fingered, so to speak, and many people are interested in it because it seems to overlap with the Paula Jones case insofar as there, the, the evidence shows that there was a threat, or at least an implied threat, have sex, what, or, but it was not carried mm. out. And a supervisor uh, said that Can he Can you describe to us what the facts were? The, yes, a, yeah. a supervisor, this was uh, the Burlington Industries, uh, uh, threatened uh, the employee that if she didn't have sex with him, there would be some adverse job consequences. She didn't have sex with him, there were no adverse job consequences. It is important to note that she did resign because she right. said that she felt that uh, in a subtle atmosphere of coercion and intimidation. The precise question before the court and the Supreme Court, lower courts are split, is whether in, as an absolute essential prerequisite for a case, you have to show tangible Injury. adverse job consequences. In our environment, someone who did that would be in danger of losing her or his job. That is to say, even if there was no consequence. In the matter of fact of running an institution, if some superior says to an inferior, have sex with me, and now the 
there. It's not, only, it's not only heterosexual, it's not only men and women. It now in the world is men to men, women to women. It crosses all the lines, but it's about power relations. If right. they do that, they're in trouble okay. even if there's but no in consequence. In fairness, Leon, the case before the Supreme Court is somewhat different. I think everybody agrees that that particular supervisor acted inappropriately. The question is whether the employer, the employing corporation, should be deemed responsible. So the question not is, the individual. Not, well, you, beyond you the, the individual. And you see the relevance of the Burlington case that Nadine just described to the Paula Jones case, because again, the Paula Jones uh, situation was that she did not suffer any adverse job consequences, and therefore, under this basic theory, did not have a quid pro quo case. I would say, however, uh, as Nadine said, the uh, question of what constitutes a harassment case is very much up in the air. But I would tend to think that no matter what constitutes it, dropping your pants and asking to be serviced should constitute it. No, but I think it's interesting that you, again, because of the reputation for conservatism, it's very interesting that you think that, and because it is vulgar, inappropriate, and if it were true, horrific behavior. But if one looks at the full range of human behavior, what mystifies me is, since we work so much as Americans, and the workplace is a large part of our lives, and sexuality is clearly a central part of our lives, no one tells the truth about their sex life anyway. So in reality, what goes on in the world is beyond our, it's always been remained private. And is the government, are we going to start to legislate by law, what we deem to be proper sexual behavior. But and it's very unusual that... that but, but um, judge, judge, judge Wright did not, did she, acknowledge that, that what happened was as recited by Mr. Gravity. No, but she said, if, if it, it were, were true, were, yeah. she said, if it were true, she said, this is e not e sexual Even then. That's yeah. right. Because there's no evidence yeah. of an actual yeah. adverse job impact. So now, that, that she conceded no, no, the that, possibility that, that he did this. That's, she, she says, because there's no adverse impact, there's no quid pro quo case. Right. She goes on to say, neither is there a harassment case, and I would think a hostile environment or harassment case, this is uh, a, uh, a very clear example. Now, it's you say, but do we want to legislate this kind of sexual mm -hmm. control? I, I suspect strongly that we don't, but we have been. We have legislated. If there is a, sex, a hostile environment uh, claim, all I'm saying is I think this is a well, strong one. Should, should it's, Burlington it's... Industries be responsible, or just the, uh, just the superintendent, whoever? I think that in this, in the facts of this case, they should not be responsible because this took place at one time. She continued in the job for a long period of time. There was no evidences or indications at the time. So there's a lot. I think the only reasonable way to deal with this problem is for an employer to simply make clear to the employees that sexual harassment will not be tolerated. They're very strongly but against it. And that any claimed uh, deviations, because Lord knows lying and suspicion and so on are inevitable here, but any claimed claims or violations of this policy should be reported within a very short yes. period of time. And if that, is, if that violation is not taken seriously and corrected, the employer that should be liable. Otherwise, of, he should not. That begs the question of what is or is not sexual yeah. harassment. Yeah, sure. People's reactions here are so different. And I have to say, um, I associate myself very strongly with Leon's drawing the line between what is appropriate versus what is illegal, and, and particularly when you're talking about vicarious liability, making what, an entire it, corporation What is liable. illegal, what is actionable? Yeah. Both? But, but yes. for example, it, the I cases... Think that, I think there should, that what is illegal should be a much smaller category than That's what right. is inappropriate. Let me speak from my own experience. As a professor, I would consider it the depth of poor judgment to have any sexual contact with any of my students. Uh, but also as a professor and civil libertarian and citizen, I would fight against a rule such as has been proposed at many universities, making it a disciplinary infraction and prohibiting any sexual contact between students and professors. It, it really goes against the assumption of adult free will in people creating their relationships. The real facts are not usually these kinds of cases. I mean, I'm not very fond of lawyers, so I'd like to keep as lawyers as far away from the conduct of our daily lives. But insofar as we have to have lawyers, let's limit them. The real cases are someone in a workplace, not an exact equal, has a relationship which seems consensual by both parties. These are adults, they're not below 18, they're experienced people, it's not their first sexual experience, they've been there before, they meet, they like each other, they work closely together, sex evolves. A relationship goes on, then the relationship goes sour, right? They're in the same, and then it's turned around and the facts are rewritten. Clearly, the, the official, 
the person who's slightly superior is liable because the policies you suggest, which we all have such policies, make it quite clear. But these people worked privately. Uh, there was no hostile environment until the relationship ended. Therefore, you want to take sex out of the workplace totally. But, but as we know psychologically, to... motivationally, sex has always been implicitly, if you take a Freudian point of view, underneath everything we do. I don't have to believe that, but that's shared by a lot of people. We can agree it's important. <laughs> well, well, let me add this, uh, Ms. Trozen, this. Uh, does, does the factor of acquiescence make it, uh, is that a, a critical fact? Now, if Paula Jones had said yes, mm -hmm. then obviously there would be no action with there. So is, is, is. Poor is, judgment. A poor. To me, it is that a critical have been the law factor. Case. No. To me, it is a critical factor, Bill, and I strongly reject the view of some feminists who say uh, uh, because women are a subordinated class in our society, uh, no woman can ever harass a man, and even a woman who thinks she means yes doesn't really mean yes because she's always being coerced by sexism. I do agree that there are complex situations where somebody can say yes and not really mean it. She feels she feels pressured, she feels coerced, she feels intimidated, but I absolutely reject the notion uh, that the woman is always going to be the victim here or that the woman cannot herself uh, sometimes be a harasser. To prove this point in the university community, because it is maybe ahead of the, the, the curve, so to speak, there have been cases brought by women against women and men against women. So and also same sex. And the issue is also the degree, the Monica Lewinsky case which is President of the United States, an intern, mm -hmm. is truly an example where saying yes as part of a power relationship is a plausible argument, no matter what gender you are. And um, at the same time, for example, the great philosopher Hannah Arendt had an affair as a student with Martin Heidegger. Mm -hmm. In the homosexual community, Ludwig Wittgenstein, John Maynard Keynes, a lot of great people. Um, there are people who come out of the Oxford system who remember their homosexual encounters with great faculty to be critical in their self-development. It's extremely, Hannah Arendt would never have brought a sexual harassment claim against Martin Heidegger. Well, what about the, the Kennedy case, the, um, the one in Florida? Um, was that William? Well, that was yeah. a rape. That's that a was rape. Well, no, no, well, well she, she, she charged rape, but, but after all, the jury found that it wasn't rape. There was a seduction. But I don't rape. trust that. I mean, I happen to think that, certainly on college campuses, the distinction, that's why there is, in fact, something called date rape. There is no question that when violence, which is, is evident, uh, and it can even be subtle, there are lines that clearly be, can be drawn between appropriate and inappropriate behavior. Our view is when a woman says no, it's no, even at the very last so-called possible moment. There's no lead on. No is absolutely clear, unambiguous. Consent is essential for any kind of appropriate sexual activity. Well, can, can uh, if I understand you, a woman can retroactively say it was, it was rape, uh, even in fact it was a seduction. But I, I'm, not, I'm not such a fan of seduction. <laughs> I'm, a fan yeah. of, I'm a fan of consent, yeah. Yeah. mutual consent. <laughs> well, Bill, you know, the, the law is evolving here. It's a very new area of law. And I think we're seeing what we often see, which is the pendulum had swung too far in one direction. Namely, there was no recognition at all of an action for sexual harassment. A and most of the victims was, were, were, and were, most of the were, were victims women. were women who were then newly gender desegregating certain places of employment or faculty or campuses uh, and they entered the workplace but then they were subject to everything from sexual propositions to threats that's not true equality then the law corrected for that and perhaps it has overcorrected by, in some cases, uh, equating falsely, in my view, any sexual conduct or behavior <clears throat> with harassment. <clears throat> the difficult problem is in each situation evaluating the facts, and I don't see how we can escape that yeah, case yeah. by case but evaluation. Let, let me ask you Bradley, this. Uh, since everybody seems to agree that clarification would be needed, is this something that should be done by a court or by legislators? It is always more desirable that laws be made by legislatures than by judges. I think even the ACLU, with their fondness for judicial rule, would agree. Uh, so it should be done by the legislature. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. 
and it therefore, as a practical matter, may have, to, may have to grow up like the common law did, incrementally with uh, decision after decision. But I think the power issue is crucial here, and the appropriateness of when someone says yes, on what condition. Uh, there's the famous case of Arturo Toscanini, who was a womanizer and uh, had an affair with a member of the London Philharmonic, a female member, when he was in his 80s, and she came late to a rehearsal, and he admonished her, and he said, in bed, Arturo, in rehearsal, maestro. Now, the point is that, that this, kind of, this kind of abuse is clearly not, should never have been tolerated, and, but was she consenting? Oh, obviously, what yes. What abuse, saying that? No, no, the abuse, the activity. Well, should, do you disagree with Nadine that a, a conductor but, should not have, we should prohibit uh, sexual relations between a employment superior and someone... But as a functioning musician, the answer is yes. Nothing is more destructive of the relationship between musicians among each other and in a classroom too than if the person who's in charge has, has a special relationship with someone in the classroom or in the orchestra. It's destructive of the whole point. I think restraint, if I'm critical of the president, if any of this is true, is not because I believe he should be impeached or what the laws are, but it shows very poor judgment. Uh, and uh, that Bill Gates, for one, is married to a former employee. There are and, hundreds uh, of such and cases. indeed, the hundreds uh, are so. But so. that is the mystery of sexuality, of why we're attracted to one another. And for the, in a democracy, for us to walk in with large galoshes, so to speak, into the sensitive water of how people conduct their lives in their private arena is well, extremely in, in, in problematic. In all possible worlds, what would the Supreme Court now do? Would they articulate uh, some sort of a model? I, I think that's going to be extremely difficult, Bill. The last time the Supreme Court wrestled with this issue, it came out with this completely open-ended standard that basically said it depends on all the facts and circumstances. You can look at how severe it was, how pervasive, was it repeated, yeah. was it targeted, <clears throat> you, was there actual injury, was there a job consequence. None of these is required and none of them is determinative. Justice Scalia, and we know how he likes to constrain discretion, uh, wrote a separate concurring opinion when he said, essentially all this boils down to is licensing individual juries in particular cases or judges if they're the fact finders to make the decision. We're but, not giving them guidance. And then he said, but, have, but, but I can't do any better than that. And I don't be, think you don't can. They have to be, the juries have to be guided by criteria. Exactly. You know, are those criteria, that all we can do is, are they codified? But, or? You know, as they are codified in the Supreme Court decisions. I've just recited them. And the court, I, I think Le, Lino's, Lino's description or analogy to the common law is exactly on point. With each new case, perhaps new criteria will develop and we'll learn from experience. But don't we yes, have yes, definitions? of hostile environment from other kinds of prejudices, for example, on religion and race. No. We don't it's have... It's the same no open-ended... The same open-ended, I see. see this, is a, this is essentially a uh, personal injury claim, what we call in law a tort claim, as distinguished from a contract claim. And tort claims usually turn on findings of negligence. Mm -hmm. And findings of negligence usually come down to putting to a jury whether this yeah. conduct was reasonable. You see, what I worry and about that's what, is... that's what this is likely going to come to, that each case the plaintiff will have a jury trial, right. on the jury will decide whether the facts she alleges, if true, are reasonable. Yeah. But from a non-lawyer's point and of Scalia view... Scalia is entirely right that that puts it in the hands of the jury, but all negligent but, law... But from a non-lawyer's view, I worry about teaching so many of our public the loss of adult responsibility. Mm -hmm. If I make a mistake as I'm growing up as an adult, I don't have recourse to the courts for the mistakes of judgment I make. Mm -hmm. The intent of making everything we do, even in our bedrooms, at a subject of litigation exactly. is a horrifying possibility that we don't take responsibility. If I made a mistake in dating this person or going out with this person or creating a relationship, superior or inferior, the idea that at the end after that, I then have, I'm, I, I get some, some reward, some kind of um, revenge or judgment that we don't teach responsibility for what we do as adults freely along there's no real quid pro quo, there's no real obvious mm -hmm. use of, of violence and superior power. The but idea is, is, the, is the principal question here, though, not, uh, uh, not whether violence was uh, implicit or explicit, but whether Burlington Industries is, is responsible. Right. I, is that the big or even the individual? Yes, and, but for all practical purposes, in terms of being able to recover damages, that's where the action is. And I think that's why we see so many. Or we can take malpractice insurance for each of us. Well, personal, do, yeah. personal behavior malpractice insurance. 
Do you have one here? Uh, no, 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 the, the institution does. Her point's very well taken. A faculty member or an administrator at Bard College, even a student, can appeal to the corporate structure, just in Burlington industry, to say, well, these people didn't abide by the rules, or the institution is responsible for failing to enforce the rules. And uh, that's a perfectly reasonable claim. Well, is it likely that the Supreme Court will finesse the difficult questions we're touching on and simply say yes or no on the corporate responsibility? I think it's, you know, with each successive case, it's harder for the Supreme Court to be as vague as it's been in the past. But as you know from following accounts of the oral argument here, Bill, the justices were mystified and baffled. They said, how did we get into this situation? And I think it's very hard to predict how they're going to come out. Maybe they'll throw it to Congress. Is that possible? The idea of Congress agree? legislating yeah. our sexual behavior in the workplace <laughs> is a frightening thought. <laughs> uh, there is no room for, there is for, in, for legislative intervention here, is there? Well, there is room if it was possible for the legislators, as indicated, to come up with rules. But it's extremely difficult. Ordinarily, in personal injury claims, we have done no better than to ha put to a jury uh, was the conduct complained of reasonable in the circumstances? That's the general tort rule, and that will probably be the rule here. I thank th you, Professor Gralia. Thank you, Professor Strossen. Thank you, President Botstein, ladies and gentlemen. was a Warren Stiebel production in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated, and the Friends of Firing Line. For information about a video cassette of this program, write to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205, or call 803-799-3449. That's Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205, or call 803-799-3449.